Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is a special episode of Matt Chat featuring David Craddock, who's uh, come back on the show as a returning guest to talk about his new book, Arcade Perfect. Now, if you're interested in the old, uh, not just the old arcade games like Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter 2, uh, Miss Pac-Man, you name it, uh, but you really are more curious about how those were ported, converted uh, for consoles, early computers. If you want the behind the scenes scoop on that scene, there's actually a lot more money involved than was ever at the arcades. Uh, then you really want to stay tuned to this episode. Anyway, uh, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Craddock. All right, folks, I am here with David L. Craddock. He's just written a new book. It's called Arcade Perfect. How Pac-Man, Mortal Kombat, and other coin-op classics invaded the living room. It's utterly fantastic. I guarantee you will want to read this book, but you probably have heard his name before. Uh, this is far from his uh, first book. He's uh, written one called Stay a While and Listen, which I also have. We did a show on that. I guess that's been a few years uh, back, but that's about how the... Let me get the full title here. Stay a While and Listen, book one, How Two Blizzards... Unleashed Diablo and forged a video game empire. And I see a whole one bunch of, of days, other I'll, books I'll... here, Dave. I didn't realize you had written so much, yeah. but got one on Breakout, how the Apple II launched the PC gaming revolution, Dungeon Hacks. Looks like uh, maybe you do some uh, fiction work as well. Yeah, a couple novels, lots of short stories. Just had one come out in an anthology a couple weeks ago, actually. Wow, what was that? What was, what was that one called? Um, this uh, that one was called Where Green Things Grew. It's kind of like a dark fantasy uh, take. It was for um, an Earth-inspired uh, anthology of, of genre stories. So I wrote about some druids who – it was actually based on two girls who um, – they were – uh, in a in a village or a city, I believe, that had been captured by Nazis during World War II. And to fight back, they would lead soldiers out into the woods on the premise of seducing them and then mm. meet up with guys out there and, and then kill them. And so I kind of took that and uh, wrapped druids and some fantasy magic around it. Do you have a preference for rather writing fiction or nonfiction? Which one's harder? Um, I, I, I think nonfiction is harder because... Yeah. Then I can't make anything up. Like these are people. You, you know how it is. Like these oh, are I know exactly. Lives. You want to get the yeah. You want to get the details right and everything. Yeah, it's one of the things I admire. You know, I was thinking about this before you came on too. How you know, so many people they they see a book like Arcade Perfect. You know, they might love the book. You know, enjoy reading it. But th do they really have a a good sense of the work? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like how hard it is. You know, even uh, just trying to line up an interview or, or figure out like how do I contact Todd Fry, for example. Like how do I yeah. even how do I even get in touch with him? Much less get him to agree, uh, you know, to sit down with me and get this uh, all this, uh, you know, answer my questions about all this stuff and how much will he remember? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know, right. Incredible amount of work. <laughs> yeah, it was. Arcade Perfect was a little bit of an exception. I've been I've been going nonstop for the past four years. In fiction and nonfiction, Arcade Perfect, I had the idea, it started as I wanted to write a column. You know, mm -hmm. each of these chapters in the book would kind of have been a column, maybe maybe in separate columns, because some chapters deal with one game but multiple versions of the same game. And then I said, well, I want to, to write it as a book, and I had a particular deadline in mind. And I actually, from, from outlining to interviews to transcribing to drafting to rewriting, it was about um three months which was pretty insane uh i was doing but I, I was having so much fun writing it i was doing like eight or nine thousand words a day uh and doing some hosting stuff at e3 and working on other freelance projects but it was just it's i think it might be the most fun i've ever had writing anything in my life because wow. it's a subject that you know if you read the introduction you know it's i'm, I'm very passionate about oh, it. Yeah. it's just a lot of fun yeah that's what really struck me about it. I, I can always tell when you're reading somebody you know, when you're reading a book by someone who didn't really, 
No, I don't want to say anything bad about them. How did you phrase it? Yeah. Like they basically regurgitate Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, versus yeah. somebody like you that was there that played the games that, you know, you can just really tell, you're writing about something you, you have a lot of passion for a lot of not just yeah. nostalgia though. It's like no. beyond that. I mean the. I think you've got so many details. Maybe I should back up a little bit and just talk about what this book is about. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll just jump right yeah, into it. it. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we've got lots of books out there, I think, about, I don't know about lots. Maybe that's accurate. But, you know, a lot of these sort of general books about, you know, what is Pong or the best games ever? You know, this sort of book. Uh, but we're kind of focused in here on the ports and like this process that people don't, again, don't really have a, Maybe a firm grasp of the uh, the talent, the skill. The, it's probably not an exaggeration. I I think to say genius really uh, that it yeah. takes to convert uh, something that was in the arcade back in like D Missile Command, Pac Man, Donkey Kong, Miss Pac Man. Sp these are some of the chapters in your book. Like, what did it take right. to get this Pong game or Space Invaders, uh, Donkey Kong, uh, from the arcade and the standard set by that arcade into a cartridge? You know, for the Atari 2600 or ColecoVision. That's the focus of your book. I mean, why that focus? Um, there are a couple of reasons. The first was was personal. You know, I grew up in... I, I remember having an Atari 2600 Junior. My Aunt Tammy got it for me for a birthday. I don't remember if I got that before I saved up uh, doing household chores for like nine months and bought my own NES. But what I remember about the 2600 was my mom had this rule. I couldn't play games until after 9 a.m. on Saturday morning because she didn't want me waking up the house. So what I did the first Saturday I had, I was so excited. I woke up at five. I was like, well, I can't wait anymore. This is ridiculous. So I crept through the house and set every clock ahead uh, <laughs> except one. So I actually played Atari. I played Donkey Kong Adventure and Olympic Games, I think, for three hours. So I was actually trudging back upstairs to my bedroom at 9 a.m., completely wiped out. And my mom meets me at the top of the stairs with her arms crossed, and I realized, oh, I forgot to get her alarm clock. Uh, <laughs> so she knew uh, what time it really was. Busted. Um, yeah, but but that was kind of the genesis of I, I loved the fact that, you know, I mentioned one of those games was Donkey Kong and I was playing it at home and it was very different from the arcade game. We'll get into that later. But those differences intrigued me on a couple levels. The first is, you know, I was uh, 10 or 11 years old when the 16 bit console war started and my friend had a Genesis and I had a Super NES. And as you can imagine, this tore our family's yeah, blood apart, feud. Man. Oh, it, it was a literal blood feud because he had Mortal Kombat with the blood code. <laughs> And he liked to rub that in my face. I had Mortal Kombat for Super with Nintendo, the sweat. but with the sweat, right? Uh, and Sub Zero like freezing his opponent and shattering them into ice cubes for a fatality, all that stuff. But I had Street Fighter Two for Super Nintendo. He had to wait a couple of years to get the Champion Edition for Genesis. But the second level this intrigued me was I, did, I no longer cared about winning. By the time I was thirteen or fourteen, I was really curious about the differences you know why did mortal kombat one on genesis have blood why were the graphics also kind of grainier which i actually thought um played into that game's gritty dirty dark atmosphere better i, I thought the color palette worked um and so you know as a kid when i would hear about oh mortal kombat 2's coming out or or street fighter 2 turbos coming out I'd, I'd start looking through magazines nintendo power game pro when you to put the game side by side because you know as a kid you don't have every console you have to choose one and you want to see how your version is going to stack up and how it'll be different and um that's something that's fascinated me into my adult life as i as i started talking to developers more i've been doing this for around 15 years or so i just realized you know the one thing i've never really written about is home ports and that's kind of like what i want to do with with everything i write i don't i don't want to i try not to retread the ground that others such as such as yourself such as david kushner have have written about um and so expertly as well like a david kushner is an example he wrote masters of doom and so mm -hmm. you know my Great editor book. at check news yeah it's a, it's a fantastic book but when my editor-in-chief asif khan at check news said you should write about id software's games i said okay but i don't want to do what Kushner did. And that's why I decided to go into Quake specifically and how that influenced, you know, other FPS games that followed. So that's what I thought, you know, so many people know the origin story of arcade games like Pac-Man, you know, the missing pizza slice and Mortal Kombat, you know, Boone and Tobias, but really we haven't paid nearly as much attention to conversions. And so I decided to make 
uh, that the thesis of this book and, and, you know, kind of the how, the why, the who, and also getting into arcade preservation, you know, chapters nine and 10 uh, focus on the Ninja Turtles cabinet coming out from arcade one up, which is more emulation. And also chapter 10 street fighter two, well, the 30th anniversary collection, which is also more emulation. And so I just kind of wanted to talk about, you know, this combination of preservation and porting in this book. Yeah. I love that when you're talking about the teenage mutant Ninja Turtles game and you're, <laughs> Your arcade and you'd already used up all your quarters, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the pain. Now, yeah, I think this I, is I, a great, uh, I just thought this was a perfect focus for a book because, and there's so many reasons. Um, I think one of, the, one of the first books I read that I, that really sort of in this genre, well, I don't even know if I call it the games book, but our, Stephen Levy's uh, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer oh, yeah, Web. Yeah. I, I just love that, you know, the, you got all the characters in there, but he, the way he sort of goes so deeply into the technology and the, the sort of engineering stuff, and you and you do the same thing in this book. Uh, so if you if you are the type of person, you know, I would say even if you don't necessarily have the engineering background to fully understand it all, <laughs> yeah, it's still just a fascinating, <laughs> you know, the the level of. I'm trying to find a good example of it somewhere, but you know, you're getting into some of the differences with the the graphics on the arcade version and the hardware they had to work with. Uh, versus the, not just the 2600, but even on the NES, you know, there's all these, you could think about them as limitations, mm -hmm. uh, but really it's, it's almost kind of a, to me, an artistry, like working, it's like changing a medium, I guess, more than from one oh. media to another media uh, than it is just a straight up, but yeah, I'm just looking here at the, I think it was, uh, was it Space, Pac-Man or Space Invaders? or Miss <laughs> <laughs> uh, But the simple trick was the, you know, the screen was rotated. Oh yeah, Pac-Man. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so what do you do with that? You know, you're trying to convert this into a uh, for a home screen, home TV, which of course back then I don't know what the you were lucky if it was color, much less. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I, I you know you still remember the 2600 it had that color black and white switch on it. You had that to oh, work. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's not telling how many uh, kids these days look at that and like what is why is there a switch to who would want to play it in black and white? Yeah, yeah. That's that's actually something I enjoyed diving into you know one one thing that a lot of people have asked me about is why the term arcade perfect what did that mean and i yeah. said well it's actually it's actually one of those fluid terms you might remember it kind of changed over time because for for a while arcade perfect on the surface i think referred to audio visuals if a game was arcade perfect it looked and sounded just like the arcade game mm -hmm. but i actually talk a lot about how um even as as early as the 2600 to some degree but especially the nes with ninja turtles 2 as an example uh, Ninja Turtles 2, you know, it lacked a lot of the features of the arcade. You couldn't play with four players. Um, the, the sprites, the character sprites were smaller, but it extended the length of each level by, by doubling it. Mm -hmm. uh, it added two new levels. It added new bosses. It added a few new cutscenes, uh, so to speak, for the day. And so it actually made someone like me, who would spend a lot of my parents' money on the arcade game, uh, appreciate the the home version even more because it felt like a very different medium and that's I couldn't articulate this at the time but looking back uh, I realized that Ninja Turtles wasn't arcade perfect in terms of audio visuals but you could make the argument that the gameplay was superior to the arcade version because of the new content yeah I, I th you know I was a kid that grew up with the you know I had the Commodore 64 and the Vic 20 before that for most mm -hmm. of my I didn't really see that many arcade games kind of growing right. up in a small town. So right. I, a lot of the times I wouldn't even see the arcade machine until much, much later. You know, so I, to me it was curious in that in that realm. I, I remember one that really stood out was, uh, I think it was Bubble Bobble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. even realize that was an arcade game. You know, it, it, it's just a kid, you know, it didn't occur to me. I played it all the time on my uh, Amiga. But that's what I found that a good passage here. So here you're talking about Alcorn and Bushnell and this Hong Pong conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you go. This is the level of detail we've got here. Uh, so this is part of page uh, twenty eight. There were two integrated circuits in the unit. One made by Cinertec or AMI, and and an off the shelf part called a TPL hex inverter, a circuit that counteracted or balanced input signals. And then we have a quote here from uh, Alcorn. How he used I used that inverter, that hex inverter, to generate a clock signal with a crystal stable enough to do color. Some of the other inverters I used to generate the voltages I needed. They didn't need any current, so the, this crystal oscillator ran at 3.58 megahertz, and I used that signal with some cheap diodes to make the voltages that I needed. Now, I don't understand that, but it makes me tingle. 
<laughs> uh, the same way. So this is, yeah, it's like, it's, I love this stuff. You know, but it's, it's perfect because that, that kind of plays to one of your earlier points. What I like to do with every, every nonfiction book about this stuff that I write is I think of technology as a stage, but the actors, to me, the people are more important. Mm. So, for example, that chapter, that's chapter one, Home Pong, which is important because, you know, that was really not only Pong was Pong like the first successful coin op game, but it was really the first home console and first home console conversion. Mm -hmm. I open with this scene that kind of shows the stakes for the people. You know, you have um, Bushnell meeting with executives from Sears who are saying, hey, if, if you guys you know, we're not going to wait for you if this if this tanks were dead. And so that kind of sets human stakes. I think that pulls you into the story, because if, if you open with that techno babble right away, oh, yeah. you're going to turn a lot of readers off. <laughs> what the heck uh, am I? <laughs> right, right. Like, what even is this? Is this a tech? Is this a technical manual or a story? I, I want to write a story. So I, I like to focus on every chapter. You'll notice I kind of I think about what's the hook, what will get you invested in these people. And then once you're invested in the people, I think your your mind opens up to the technical challenges they face because that's such an important part mm -hmm. of each of these stories yeah it really that was a there's so much in this pong chapter and i don't know how much other people might know about the story already but you know all this all the stuff with the jackals and the and the odyssey <laughs> I, did, I just love that idea of uh you know with bushnell there he's complaining about all the copycats and throwing a fit about <laughs> it it's like everything's the jackals you know the copycats but you know come to right. find out he he himself was the jackal <laughs> <laughs> yeah at least according at least yeah. according to uh, uh to ralph bear so you do have all the you know you got all this sort of uh, i guess what, what would you call that sort of personal drama yes uh, character drama uh, that mm -hmm. would make for great television even uh, but with you know the technical stuff is here as well right you know for those that do want to go far far beyond you know get into the weeds of, on the technology so i think it, i think you did a really fantastic job weaving those two uh, weaving those two themes together. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was, it was a tough act, but um, it was also really a lot of fun to do because, you know, like I said, I found that I could get more technical, you know, that, that comes from page 28. And so that's, that's at a point where I felt we were deep enough into the chapter that really, even if you don't understand half of what Alcorn said, and to be honest, I really don't either. The context is such that this is very high stakes. He has to get this right. He has to make it color so that it's appealing so that they can sell this and it's successful for Atari and, and Sears. And I, I think our fingers crossed, I hope that that comes across. Yeah, I really, I've always enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, the TIA reading about the television interface adapter. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, I was. Uh, who is it? What's the guy's name? Ian Bogost, racing the beam. I think he wrote that with uh, uh, yes. Nick Montfort. Mm -hmm. Were you in inspired by that at all? Yeah, I, I was. I read that. In fact, it's something I I uh, cite I think more than a few times in Arcade Perfect. Um, that that's sort of interesting too, because you had the human drama there, but it was you know these tech guys and what they were trying to do, and um, that was that was a major influence as well. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about Pong. You know, this is maybe something else we should talk about before we dive into some of these other topics. But you know, we think when people write. Or think about something like Pong or uh, Space Invaders or Donkey Kong. It seemed like all of the attention is always on those arcade machines. Yeah. And it's like King of Kong. I don't know if they ever even show, showed the uh, any of the home versions of that, you know, that documentary. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but really, that's not, I don't know, maybe you, you'd be the one to ask, you know. <laughs> the arcade <laughs> versions obviously were successful. They made a lot of money, but... Would you say that those home versions were actually where most people probably played the game and that's where most of the money actually was in the industry? Oh, oh, for sure. Um, you know, Mortal Kombat made millions of dollars in quarters, but it made tens of millions yeah. of dollars on, you know, between, you know, Mortal Monday was this this four-pronged attack of a release on Super Nintendo, Genesis, Game Gear, and Game Boy. And, I mean, that Game Boy version, and again, I, I don't like to drag anyone through mud either, but that was not very good <laughs> but i had it when you know when mortal kombat came out that was the only platform i had that mortal kombat was available for so i remember my, going to a hair appointment with my mom sitting in the lobby playing mortal kombat like 
I really do love this game. I really do. And then like a year later, I got the Game Gear version. And then a year after that, I got, I think, the Super Nintendo version and then the PC version. I was buying these. So they got my money, my $30, 40 $50, whatever it was at the time, probably like 80 for Super Nintendo. Uh, thank goodness I had a paper route that yeah. took months to save up for one Super Nintendo game. But, um, you know, there, there's an example of uh, some, uh, you know, a kid who got better hardware and who wanted to play his favorite game with better graphics, more characters, blood codes, what have you. Uh, yeah, definitely the home versions were really where the money was at. But th the funny thing was you wouldn't know that to look at some of the conversions. And, uh, you know, no one ever sets out to make a bad game. But Atari, for example, in the case of, of Gary Kitchen converting Donkey Kong to the 2600 or Todd Fry, you know, in the case of Pac-Man, they both said, you know, if I if you can bump the cartridge space up to 4K instead or 8K instead of 4K, I could do more graphics, more levels, more sounds. And they said people are going to buy it anyway. Who cares? And it's just kind of staggering to, yeah, to, to that learn attitude. That, that attitude. Just, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's talk about squandering an opportunity. But I guess they had a point, right? People did buy the Pac-Man. They were going to buy that. <laughs> probably would have bought it even if it said does not actually work. You know, they probably would have. <laughs> Would have yeah. pointed up for that. It's, it's amazing. Right. Yeah, I think the Gary Kitchen story is probably one of my, my one of my favorites in the book. With the, just such a smug, the arrogance. <laughs> and he <laughs> now, I don't know too. if I've heard that story before. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you would like to share that. What happened with him and his? Sure, sure. Rather and, smug. And uh, <laughs> ended up getting uh, put in his place in a way. He did, he did. And, you know, to, just to preface this, I'll say that he admits it and he shared it in a very self-deprecating way. Yeah. But the idea here is that um, he thought he was really hot stuff because he was converting Donkey Kong to 2600. And you know what? In all fairness, he was. You have to remember that he was working on that conversion in the early 80s during a time when, unless you worked for Atari and then a little bit later Activision, no one else in the world knew how to program 2600 games because this was before third party publishing was taken as a matter of course as it yeah. is today. They weren't exactly wanting it to happen either. No, they, they didn't. It's crazy to think about how, like, boy, if the Nintendo 64 was only Nintendo games, it had like six, but I'd have loved them all. So, um, so, you know, Gary Kitchen, even before he was finished with Donkey Kong, he was calling around. He called A Atari, he called Activision because he was contracted by Coleco to do the, the Atari port. And he got a hold of, um, Tom Lopez, I believe, at Activision said, hey, I'm, I'm Gary Kitchen. I'm converting Donkey Kong to the 2600, and I'm, I'm trying to think about what to do next, and I'd love to come work for you. So so Tom Lopez comes out, and he takes a look at the port, and the thing that, that Gary had been struggling with was that, uh, you know, in the, in the iconic first level of Donkey Kong, those ramps are slanted so that some tilt to the right, some tilt to the left, and the barrels roll down. But he couldn't do that because the Atari, the TIA, as we talked about earlier, was not meant to do that. It could mirror sides of the screen, but you couldn't have different graphics on either side. Uh, so Tom, Tom, Tom plays the game, and as he leaves, he says, well, you know, this is pretty cool, Gary, but I'll tell you right now, if you work for Activision, those ramps would be slanted. And then he leaves. So, <laughs> so Gary goes threw back. down the gauntlet. He really did. He, and so Gary's like, all right, I got to do this. So he figured out how to do it. Now, save the specifics for the books, for the book. But um, what happened was it ended up eating up so much cartridge space that he had to cut two of the arcades for levels. It it comes out and he, but, but you know, before it comes out, uh, he's he's back to being courted by Activision and Atari. And these these companies are rolling out the red carpets, you know, first class flights, nice hotels, steak dinners. And he decides, well, I want to work to act for Activision. Atari hears this, and they, they drive him out in a limo to meet with Manny Gerard, who was one of the Warner executives. And Manny says, Gary, what can we do to make this happen? And Gary said, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I could never work for a company that released a piece of shit like Pac-Man. Because Pac-Man, you know, Todd Fry's conversion for the 2600 had just come out. And, and Gary said, you know, when I said that, I was this smug guy. I was really full of myself, and I never stopped to consider – gee, maybe Todd was under a lot of the same restrictions as I was. And, and, you know, we alluded earlier that he got put in his place. I mean, Gary's Donkey Kong conversion for 2600 is as infamous, if not more, than Todd <laughs> Fry's version of Pac-Man. But, the, you know, that's actually – I'm actually glad he, he shared that story. Yeah, because you've got to admire Gary for being willing to share something like that. You have to. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, he's, he was, he's humble about it now. He realizes that he was very full of himself. But also – it goes to show that not even 
the programmers back then understood the restraints that their peers were under, much less the you know gamers back then, and even even today, people people have really softened on those two conversions because mm -hmm. they have a better understanding of the 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 hopes on fire that these programmers had to jump through. I mean, again, consider consider the impact of Pac-Man and Donkey Kong in arcades, and now you're being told you're one programmer, you have six months. Uh, we don't really care if it sucks or not. Good luck. And, you know, the restraints they had to work with, that, that again, was one of my impetuses for writing this was just to show people, hey, this was really, really hard to do. Yeah, I think that's the, one of the great parts of it. You know, especially, I, I think, in the sort of casual folks out there, maybe they've played Pac-Man in the arcade, they sort of heard the story, like, oh, don't play the... You know, the 2600 version sucks. <laughs> you know, maybe right. they don't even... Well, okay. Uh, they don't really understand anything about... Well, actually, you know, does it really suck? <laughs> you know, oh. or was there actually quite a, lo a lot of uh, cleverness and, you know, breakthroughs, you know, in oh, that yeah. product? I mean, we've been Absolutely. talking about Pac-Man, but we could also talk about uh, several other ones, right, that have these... I remember talking to a guy one time about E.T. <laughs> it's got yeah. like it's sort of the worst, you know, game ever or whatever. But he's yeah. like, a lot of that is just hype. You know, people kind of like saying that. But, you know, have you ever really sat down and looked at E.T. and, you know, and appreciate what it accomplishes? Because apparently, you know, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this. <laughs> uh, but according <laughs> to him, it's like, actually, there's a lot of great stuff about E.T. Well, I mean he's he's right to a degree i'm sure he does feel defensive about it even to this day how would you feel waking up every morning oh. knowing that you considered the auteur of, of like the worst game ever <laughs> but like it's i think it puts into context like video games being an enthusiast hobby sometimes we have to you know we sex up our headlines oh, uh sure, because we exactly. really we really it's almost like professional wrestling where even today where this multi-billion dollar industry but maybe people are still a little defensive about making toys or things for geeks in their mom's basement even though gaming is maybe the biggest hobby in the world and so we have to keep up that urban legend of et being the worst game ever whereas i'm over here like have you guys played superman 64 i mean you know <laughs> yeah what was it pac-man and uh donkey kong as well you might you know, kind of you kind of make me want to go back and play these uh, ports again. I'm gonna definitely do that. Just it kind of gives me a new appreciation, I think, for those those ports. It it does, and the, the Pac-Man chapter, chapter. You know, my interview with Todd Fry was yeah. was interesting because he said at the time, you know, I start the chapter again, the human stakes, where Atari says we need two conversions: Defender, Pac-Man, and one of the other programmer goes, oh dibs on defender which is what really todd fry wanted to do he really didn't care about pac-man so it's it's not that he approached the project from a point of view of disdain it was just like well i don't really like this type of game but i'm gonna abstract he it thought it was I, kind of a stupid game right he, he does he did he was just like i don't really get the appeal of this it's just one little hockey puck being chased by ghosts in a maze and he said so i figure as long as i have that that's Pac-Man. And he, he was really impressed with, for example, his ghost AI routines, which were, were pretty impressive. But other things, he said, you know, if I could go back today and change the colors so that the maze oh, yeah. was black and the walls were blue, like nobody told me that is part of the essence of Pac-Man. Whereas really back then, I don't I don't know that it was. Games, like, like anything historical, are something that we need some distance to realize what is kind of the the soul, the, the mm -hmm. genesis qua almost of this? And nowadays we know, oh, it's it's the color scheme. But back then, yeah, I didn't even know that about Atari's policy about the black backgrounds. Right, and that, that's something that's been disputed. So, I do yeah. think I, I mentioned that, like it's it's it might be apocryphal because a lot of other developers couldn't remember that, um, and there there's not a lot of documentation back then. I even asked Al Alcorn, and he said oh, that was after my time, but I know that while I was there, I don't remember anything like that. So the, what, the I guess the, for those who don't know, the legend was right that you could only have black backgrounds in a space game, right? But there was something with the TVs and a burn in. Or phosphor. <laughs> it's like right. it's sort of coming back. Yeah, what was it? So it was basically screen burn in would happen if you had a black yeah. screen. Yeah. Kind of the predecessor to burn in on, on plasma TVs a few generations later. Yeah. Uh but yeah, that well there was a lot of cannabis going back and forth and yeah, There sure was. You know, I just was wondering, <laughs> you know, when you talk to these guys were was it just like a spaghetti stories trying to figure out what what actually happened, what's being misremembered? Uh oh, it what was. who to trust i mean it must have you must have had to use a lot of your own uh 
cross-examination techniques, if you will, to try to get to oh. the, the bottom of this. Almost, you're almost kind of like a detective or an archaeologist. Yeah, in fact, that's. Uh, <laughs> I think a few people got a little defensive, and I even said at the beginning, you know, I might mention some points or ask some questions that seem to criticize you or your ports, but that's not true. I kind of just want to see if we can get to the bottom of some some myths. And there were a few people, I won't name names, who got a little defensive, but they did come to understand, oh, I get it, you know, history said this. And uh, a lot of people in those circumstances, I think, feel compelled to, compelled to speak truthfully, or at least from the heart, because they realize, well, uh, this might be kind of a chance to clear my name, so to yeah. speak. But I did have to do a lot of cross-referencing, a lot of reading, because there is so much, you know, we talked about Wikipedia earlier. There's a lot of uh, false data on Wikipedia it's just one of those things where you have to vet your sources. And I, I think that's kind of what um, I'm, I'm not trying to get on a high horse here, but that's something that separates journalists like me and you from, you know, influencers. Influencers aren't journalists. They are they are entertainers. Some of them know that a lot of them don't. But if you're if you're a journalist, if you're a nonfiction writer, you are trying your best to uh, disseminate facts rather than continue to spread rumors that maybe yeah. have no basis. Yeah, it's one of the. Well, one of the great things, too, by focusing in on all these dialogues and getting a sense of who these people are, you can sort of see, well, these are these are human beings, right? And they're, yeah, you know, they've exactly. got their own motivations. Right. And you sort of lay that out for the reader. So, you know, yeah. I think yeah. somebody, somebody that wants to read between the lines will pick up on certain things. Sorry. Yeah, they definitely can. Uh, so let's see what else we've got here. You wanted to talk about the uh, yeah, Street Fighter 2 is probably one of the biggest arcade games of all time. I remember that. Uh, we had a Street Fighter II <laughs> machine. <laughs> I think they had them in Walmart, you know, of all, of all places. You remember back when these arcade machines, you'd go into a Walmart and there'd be these, uh, like, Street Fighter II, all these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd have them at restaurants, retail stores. And the thing back then was if an arcade game make money, made money, like, you didn't have to go to an arcade to play it. Like, operators of, I mean, even laundromats you'd find. Oh, absolutely. Games, which you think was ingenious. Like, if you're going to have change anywhere, it's a laundromat. So you of may course, well you know, your mom's people. there doing the laundry. She's got the quarters. Yeah. <laughs> like, here you yeah. go, kid. <laughs> Yeah, play stay that. out of my hair for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, matter of fact, I think that was where I found my bubble bobble machine with uh, oh. a laundromat, and for whatever reason, they had that. <clears throat> but anyway, <laughs> everybody knows how big a game a Street Fighter Two was, but in the arcades. But you make the point that it was again probably even more impact in the home game conversions, especially it when really we get into these uh, the Sega and the uh, SNES versions. It, it really was because – so there are a lot of differing views on this. Uh, one of the people I interviewed was uh, Dan Amrich, who was known as Dan Electro. He was one of the editors of Game Pro. He wrote for Official Xbox Magazine, a whole bunch of magazines. Like Guitar like, Pedals with that name or something? Yes, yes. Uh, he's a big guitarist too. Um, but he, he – uh, I asked him, I said, do you think that Street Fighter II is one of the most important consoles from the 16 – or titles from the 16-bit console war? And he said, I wouldn't go that far. You know, it really came down to first party stuff like Mario and Sonic. But I respectfully disagree with Dan there, because if you remember, um, one of the big turning points for Nintendo during that time against Sega was that they landed the console exclusive for Street Fighter 2. Now, Sega got it later when Champion Edition came out, but Super Nintendo kind of had the had the head start. And then on the flip side, a year or so later, Mortal Kombat came out and the, the Genesis version of that game sold five to one or 10 to one because of the blood code. So I think yeah. that really illustrates the importance of, you know, fighting games and third party games in general, but also Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and the fact that they really did turn tides back then. Yeah, that was one of the, I don't think about the Mortal Kombat thing and it's, it's sort of the early version. I guess the debate goes all the way back to the beginning with all these, all the hype about media violence or video yeah. game violence. And look, look here, and they, I, don't, I think they must have showed that uh, Sub Zero's thing. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I was like on repeat reels on some of these, uh, oh yeah, uh, news channels back in the day. But I mean, the interesting thing there was it wasn't just about the technology. You know, at that point there were all these policies and censorship and you know branding, image yeah. issues, and it was, it was really interesting diving into that. It was, and some of the some of my favorite stories came from Jeff Peters, who was a, a creative director at Sculptured Software and, and the team lead for Mortal Kombat One and Two on the Super NES. 
And he actually said that, you know, Sculptured Software was based in Utah, and there are parts of that state that are still very heavily Mormon. And he lived in one of those states. He didn't really share his review, uh, religious views with me, but he said that, you know, he lived in a neighborhood that was um, pretty pretty conservative. And, you know, he'd do the, almost the thing you see in movies where, you know, you come out in your robe in the morning, and you get your paper, and you wave at your neighbor over the hedge as they're watering their lawn. But he said that when the neighbors kind of figured out, oh, this guy's working on Mortal Kombat, like they snubbed him. The pariah. The whole <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so the pariah <laughs> froze him out. But the funny thing was kids would sneak over to his house like, hey, can we play Mortal Kombat? Like they wanted to play the early versions of it. It just goes to show you that the more you make something taboo, the more people do want to get their their hands on it. So that was kind of one of those instances where I wanted to really highlight the, the cultural importance of, of this game, not only on on the world at large, but uh, on on certain religions and also the team making it. I mean, he had a programmer there who said, uh, you know, if my family comes by or you talk to them, you have to tell them I'm working on something else because I, I, <laughs> I cannot, it cannot be known that I'm on Mortal Kombat. It was that, that, that to that extent. It was pretty crazy. You had a story in here. You might have to remind me of the details, but there was a, the designer of the game was in a store and the mom and the kid was, uh, standing around he's like oh by the way i made that game and <laughs> mom bought it and the clerk bought it and they got him to sign it and he was just so you know yeah that was, uh, his status you know, who was that uh that was uh mike micah or, or mike mika uh the, now the studio head of digital eclipse and he yeah. was working on one of the disney games uh, and he also got his start. He got his start doing conversions. Uh, he did NFL Blitz and Mortal Kombat 4 for Game Boy Color, which uh, were not exactly well received ports. But what are you supposed to do taking these big, highly impactful 3D games and putting them on the Game and what Boy? What is somebody with a Game Boy Color? What do they think they're going to get? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're it's... expecting like a full 3D, you know, come on. It's, it's so weird. You know, I, I think a lot of times. Um... I guess they, some of them are kids might think that. Well, yeah, it's it's funny. Like, I think a lot about the differences of, of someone like you and me who, who work in this industry or at least, you know, uh, privy to talking a lot of the people who work in it and some someone casual. I think that, you know, Mike even said one of the quotes I think I shared in the book was that we never expected it to compete with, you know, the arcade or the Nintendo 64 conversions. We just thought, you know what, uh, people who want to play this game on the go, this will be something for them to play. Uh, because there wasn't there wasn't a switch back then or a PSP obviously and he actually said um, that theory bore out because the like the Game Boy Color version of NFL Blitz sold a lot and it's just it shows that hey people wanted that on the go they didn't expect to get like a one to one translation but they had Blitz in the in their back pocket when they wanted to play it I just love this idea of the guy it's kind of one of my fantasies I'd love to be in a bookstore one day and see the <laughs> oh by the way Same. I wrote that book. <laughs> Same. Same. Never happened yet, so uh, we'll see. Uh, you got something here, too, about Miss Pac-Man and Tetris being so enduring. That's kind of a, I think that ties in well with our Game Boy discussion, because that, to me, is a game, Tetris, that did translate really well uh, into a, uh, in this case, a handheld. Now, I'd go so far as to say that kind of ignited the handheld gaming industry. Would you go that far? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that packing Tetris in with Game Boy, you could make the, Genius not only... Move. Not only, yeah, and, and not only that argument that it ignited handheld games, um, but that it was probably it probably did more for handheld gaming than even packing in, say, Super Mario Land. You know, Mario was was all the rage back then, but Tetris was something like not everybody wants to. Everybody wants to play a Mario game. Running and jumping can be hard. I remember the first time I handed my mom an NES controller, she walked Mario off the cliff, and I just took it back, shaking my head like, <laughs> "What have you done?" But anyone can play Tetris. Oh, wow. It's so much more accessible. Uh, and so, yeah, that game was just hugely important. Let's see. We got the difference between preserving and corrupting arcade games. Yeah, that that was preserving an Preserving and corrupting arcade games. That's, that's something um, that a lot of people have pointed out as one of their favorite points in the book. That came from – that observation came from Daniel Filner, who was the – uh, he's the emulation programmer for a lot of the arcade one-up cabinets and also digital eclipses anthologies of classic games. Um, he's kind of a, a specialist in in Street Fighter II emulation. And the funny thing there is he said that game passed him by. He grew up playing Pac-Man, so he's never really been interested in Street Fighter. But here he is kind of like the, the guy you turn to when you need an emulated version of it. Um, and he said that, you know, a lot of people look at emulation as a way to preserve history. And... 
In the the less legal sense, it might be if you were to download a Street Fighter II arcade ROM. You know, the main team they they even espouse their mission is we're trying to preserve history. We're not encouraging you know trading games illegally. But in Daniel Filner's case for Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, he said, you know, he had kind of a filter. He talked to Digital Clips, who talked to Capcom, and that was kind of the, tel- the game of telephone they played. And according to him, uh, Capcom wanted him to change certain parts of the game. They wanted him to get win of that. Uh, get rid of that now classic uh, winners don't do drugs. Yeah, that was that was one of my favorite parts. You know, so the, yeah. I mean, the irony here. <laughs> so, right, right. So I right. guess I don't even know why they had the. Basically, all the arcade machines were running this winners don't do drugs is sort of anti drug message from the FBI. You know, yeah. it's kind of that classic case of a no good deed goes unpunished, right? <laughs> uh, so right. suddenly, why in the way do they want that removed? It was um, so. This actually ties into the other content. Capcom wanted him to change. If you look at, if you look up the uh, Street Fighter II, the World Warrior, the, the first release, uh, World Warriors, uh, in Chun Li's stage, in the in the on the left side, there was a stall with crates that were red, and they had the white Coca Cola swish through them. And Capcom said, "Well, we want that change because we don't want to pay Coke licensing fees." You think and Coke so- would be paying them? Well, uh, yeah, or vice versa. But they also like they'd have to go and like talk to people, and it would just be, uh-huh. you know, the idea behind ports and emulation is get this done as quickly as possible, so we can make as much money as possible. And uh, <laughs> Daniel said that kind of puts me in the pickle because what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of emulation programmers don't have access to the original source code. You know, this is a game from 1991. A lot of people at Capcom now. They know that Street Fighter Two is one of the most important games of all time, but if you ask them where the source code is. They have no idea. So he said he had to come up with ways to alter these pixels without actually going into the code. Because the thing is, he said, my analogy is it's kind of like a spider web. Or if you start pulling on one strand, you might rip a whole bunch of them. So what he did was for the FBI screen, you know, the logo changed. And he said rather than change that, he said, I just used the breakpoint, which is a programming technique where you just skip over it. So it's still in there. He's just hopping over it. So you could have changed uh, it to, like, winners do do drugs, you know? Yeah, you could change that to anything you want. Uh, I, just, I just flabbergasted that they would, anybody well, would want that removed. It, it, it's funny, too, because that's such a that was such a big part of arcades. I remember seeing that everywhere. You know, it was on the Ninja Turtles attract screen. But he said, he said in his opinion, he doesn't just preserve arcade history. I mean, think history. of all the kids that would have done drugs if they didn't see oh, that Oh, I know. I, that's, you know, that we're corrupting a whole generation <laughs> now because that message is gone. But, you know, Daniel said the funny thing was he, he almost considers himself. I said, do you, do you think of yourself as someone kind of charged with helping to preserve gaming history? He said, no, I kind of corrupt it because I go in there and make changes mm. like that. And it's not my decision. I'm, I'm just doing what I'm told. But I thought that was a really interesting point that it's, it's very subtle, right? If you play Street Fighter 30th anniversary, even someone, even these pro players who, who won money playing Street Fighter 2 might not pick up on that. But it is, in fact, a difference from the original game. Yeah, I was really fascinated by this uh, when you started talking about emulation and how that differs from the porting process before. And like why Pong, some of the oldest games are a lot harder or even impossible to emulate uh, than some of the later games. Where I guess if you know what sort of processor was being used, I think you described it kind of as a modular process they could yes, they could use to recreate these uh, games. And, and that was really, really interesting. Yeah, a lot of that fascinated me. I mean, there there were people who um, kind of worked without a safety net, so to speak. You know, some programmers I talked to said, oh, you know, I worked in an office and the company uh, bought an arcade cabinet of, you know, GameX I was converting and rolled it right up into my cubicle so I could just turn around at my desk and play for a little bit. Others, uh, such as Paul Crothers, who uh, adapted Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which is known as T2, the arcade game on consoles, um, he said, I, I played that only a few times because a lot of local arcades didn't have it. They sent me a videotape of someone playing through the game, and I just had to watch that. Wow. And he said, so because of that, if you look at, like, he did the Genesis slash Mega Drive port. And he said, if you look at that, I'm missing a lot of these small architectural details and screens, not because I couldn't squeeze them in, but because I just didn't notice them. And in fact, he said, uh, really, what I'm proudest of in that game is getting the light gun working, because that was very difficult. And I explained why in Arcade Perfect. But he said, with Mortal Kombat, he kind of wanted to redeem himself, because he, he felt he didn't get off to the best start as a converter uh, with T2. I thought that was interesting. All right, so David, let's uh, wrap up with a couple of your last points here, which I 
I, you know, I think are well worth exploring. And again, there's a book about this, folks. So you know, buy David's book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're getting it. like the gloss, uh, the gloss of stuff here. But this is like, you know, the meat in this book is incredible. Uh, but you talk about how there's many definitions of arcade perfect. And, you know, yeah. some people, I guess the term refers only to the look of the, the sprites or the vectors or whatever. So for some people, that's the definition, right? Does it look identical? Uh, whereas other people, it's the, really the important thing is, does it play identical? You know, I'm thinking yes. about Pac-Man here is a good, a good example of that. You know, does it have those patterns? <laughs> right, right. Uh, so even though you might not, might look very similar or the same, but there's actually profound differences. So, you know, where do you come down on that? You know, it's it's funny. Um, I think arcade perfection was important, but I also think it's one of those terms with, I don't know, it's almost like connotative and, and denotative definitions. Where uh, I think if you want to, if you want to, if you want to ask, well, what was the maybe one of the first games that was arcade perfect? Um, I can't tell you that objectively. I can tell you that the first game I played that seemed to be a one to one recreation uh, was Street Fighter Alpha on PlayStation One. That had a new mode. Um, but other than that new mode and loading time, that game played just like the arcade game because, you know, the PlayStation between the CD based storage and, and the graphics capabilities it was finally able to to bring an arcade game home. But in Arcade Perfect, uh, in Chapter 16, which is on San Francisco Rush 2049, I talk about the N64 and the Dreamcast. And you can't really talk about the Dreamcast and arcade games without mentioning the port of Soul Calibur. Um, a lot of people believe that is when games went beyond arcade perfection because Soul Calibur was actually not, was technically ported. Um, they didn't carry over the source code. Everything was rebuilt from scratch. The character models look better. The animations are smoother. There are more stages, more characters, more modes. But when I think about going beyond arcade perfection, I, I am one of those people who thinks about gameplay. And again, this is more anecdotal, but I think that happened in the NES era. You know, earlier I mentioned uh, Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game on NES. Uh, no, it didn't look or sound as good as the arcade game, but it had more levels. It had different bosses. It had more cutscenes. It actually felt like a meteor game. Um, you know, if you had a few bucks, you could you could blaze the trail through that game in 20 minutes. The NES game might take you an hour or so more because the pacing, they changed the pace so that that game is almost impossible to speed run. You can only play it so fast. And um, it's it's funny, I think in chapter th three on Missile Command, I talked with Rob Fulop, who was actually scolded by Atari when he did a port of Space Invaders for the Atari 400-800 PCs. They said, you know, you change too much. You need to stick to the conversions. And he said, well, that's weird. I just thought people might like this new content, but okay, I'll stick to the conversions. And I think over time, um, there was definitely this, this tug of war between consumers who wanted exactly what they played in the arcade and people like me who wanted that, but maybe a little more. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. Yeah. You know, and I think that concept lives on in the form of some of these remakes and reboots we're seeing. Remember yes. some of the Telltale games where they'll have the, you know, the original mode, you know, for those that, you know, really care about that original aesthetic. And right. they'll have, like, the enhanced editions of, uh, you know, just interviewing, uh, you know, the, the Beam Dog uh, CEO, yeah. and he's doing all these reboots of uh, Baldur's Gate and Planescape. You know, that's the kind of questions right. that come up, right? Well, we just want, just leave it, we want the exact same thing we remember. Yeah. And he's like, no, you don't. <laughs> You know, you know, you know there's what, a lot know. of stuff that you forget about. Yeah. Uh, it's actually much better in these enhanced versions. Yeah, it's those rose-colored glasses, right? right? And I, I think that you made such a great point earlier when you said, uh, well, I don't remember how you put it, but there's a difference between retro and nostalgia. Nostalgia mm -hmm. is playing a game exactly as it was, maybe more so than you remember it being. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I think, you know, I also talked to, to other folks from Digital Clips for Street Fighter and, you know, Frank Cifaldi, who's who's also the, the head of the Video Game History Foundation. He said he doesn't believe that people, even people like us who grew up playing these games, he doesn't believe we want the exact same experience because it's it's different. Our tastes have changed. Games have evolved. Yeah, but we want the uh, same feeling, but not necessarily we want the, the we same. We want the same feeling. Right. And, and so he said that one thing Digital Eclipse has been doing is, as an example, I believe after Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, if I'm correct, came uh, SNK 40th Anniversary Collection. One thing they did that was they implemented what's called a watch mode, where you can start a game and 
uh, the AI, which is um, implemented by having a pro player go through the whole game, will play for you. And at any time you want, you can just jump in. But it's actually a really good way to get past a lot of those notoriously cheap and overly difficult parts of games. Uh, but also, he said, what Digital Eclipse likes to do, not only modes like that that change how you approach a game, but they really want to, they want their games to be almost like digital monuments. They want mm. old design documents, they want concept art, you know, they want little documentaries. Because, you know, when you think about it, yes, yeah, Street Fighter 2 is great, but do I really want to pay 40, 50 bucks for a game that I paid like 84, 1991? No, but I will pay that much, maybe a little more, if you give me some some bonuses with it that give me more insight into what went into the making of that game and why it was historically important. And I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah, that is. It reminds me of some of these, uh, you know, when they come out with a new disc edition of some movie and they <laughs> has yeah, all these yeah, cool yeah. special features on it. And, <laughs> you know, how many of those have you bought? You don't even... You might not even watch the movie. You just want to see these special features, the behind the scenes, the commentary. You think there's going to be more of that? I'm, I'm, I think so. I think that's definitely. You know, it's funny. I, I was going to say that you can almost go too far in that direction. I know a lot of Star Wars fans who probably buy re-releases just to shake their fists at George Lucas. Like, <laughs> I can't believe you changed this too. Um, but I do definitely think that games will include more of those going forward. And I think I think that they should. I think that the work that companies like Digital Eclipse and Beamdog are doing is hugely important because they have, they have to walk such a tightrope, don't they, between preserving a game so that people like us who played it back in its day still appreciate it, but also, you know, this is a business. You need to sell the units to new players as well, and what's going to bring them to the game? It's it's really hard to kind of serve both of those masters, so to speak. So kudos to them for, for putting such TLC into everything they do. Yeah, I was just thinking of the of Pac-Man again and, those, and the patterns. And, oh, and a lot of people, yeah. once they learn these patterns, they can, they can play the game really well. Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking about, well, couldn't the game be made better, though, if they just improved the AI so there wasn't yeah. kind of the patterns in there? And, you know, a certain type of person would be like, yes, that would make it better, whereas <laughs> probably the <laughs> the majority of the audience that would be interested in that game would consider that nothing short of, a, you know, an atrocity or something. That you would yeah. even consider that. That's, that's what Pac-Man is. Right, right. And, well, and that's the funny yeah. thing. I talk about this, but, you know, I talked to several people who, who worked on Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man conversions, and they said, you know, nobody gave us source, co source code. Yeah, that's, we a, that's came amazing up... to me. I mean, yeah, you know what, isn't it? You know, people probably, you, they, they did not have the source code to work with, <laughs> much less, you know, the assets. And so all these, like, having high to be recreated. profile games, you know, it's... It would it's have been crazy. challenging if they had the source code, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. To, to a degree, they actually said it would have been more difficult because they might have gotten too focused on how do I translate this rather than kind of figuring it out themselves and, you know, kind of creating something that evokes the spirit of a game. And, and that's actually the funny thing. Uh, talking about Arcade Perfect, even if Pac-Man audiovisually would have looked and sounded exactly like the arcade game on 2600, Todd Fry who didn't have the source code said I had to study those ghosts and come up with facsimiles of the routines myself. So he, he actually thought, and I agree with him that part of the appeal of playing the game, the home versions was if you already mastered the routines in arcades by this version, because they're different, you know, you'll have to relearn it. It's a new challenge. Yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, also last question then, and this is something I think is that probably maybe many people have wondered you know, the, there's people like me that would buy this book, no question, just because, we, you know, we love the source material, we love the, the subject matter. You know, but what about somebody else that's like, you know, this was this is history, you know, I'm making modern stuff. You know, what yeah. why do I need to know about Arcade Perfect? What, what's in this book for me? So, it's funny, uh, I've gotten, I'm, I'm very uh, thrilled and humbled to have received a, a number of endorsements for this book, and um, uh, I can't remember who said it. Uh, it was uh, it was David Bamberger who was um, he's kind of most uh, famously or maybe infamously known for being the director of marketing at Sony for Final Fantasy VII. He came up with those really hard hitting confrontational campaigns for Final Fantasy VII that right. you know really took it to Nintendo sixty four. But he said this reading about this kind of makes me think, and I'm paraphrasing. He, he said it makes me realize that nothing has really changed. Game development is still so hard. There's you never have enough people on your team. You never have enough resources. You never have enough time. And so, you know, even though these these 
these stories I've written in Arcade Perfect are about games that are decades old, it's still, according to people who still work in the industry today, uh, because David Bamberger is part of the, the PUBG team now, uh, still offers an incredible amount of insight into contemporary processes. Yeah, I agree 100%. <laughs> so you, you know, first <laughs> watching this is like, oh, well, what does that have to do with the you know, right. modern design? Just look, you know, you can learn so much by reading about how people have overcome challenges. The details are different now. <laughs> the challenges, yeah. the attitudes... Uh, that spirit of innovation are still with us still yeah very necessary yeah uh, so there you have it folks arcade perfect how pac-man mortal Kombat, and other coin-op classics invaded the living room <laughs> invaded the living room uh by <laughs> david l craddock now where can people get this book david well first of all matt I'll, I'll make a solemn promise to you and your viewers that one day i'll come up with a subtitle that rolls off the tongue <laughs> yeah. um but until then uh, you can find this. The easiest place to go, I would say, is arcadeperfectbook.com. I've got Arcade links Perfect to book.com. Correct. Uh, there's it'll be out September 13th, which is the 26th anniversary of Mortal Monday and you know, Mortal Kombat's release oh, on home nice. systems. Yes, yes, and uh, it's available in paperback and on Kindle. Uh, it'll probably be in Amazon first, but this eventually will be something you can find at uh, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, and other other bookstores. Excellent. Now, if people want to go sign copy, is there a place on the website for that? Or... I'm hoping to 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 add that very soon. Not right now, but hopefully very soon. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to share, uh, share all this information about your book. Uh, folks, you know, I've read this. Go get it. <laughs> I guarantee you will like it. You will love this. You know, I can't recommend it highly enough. And uh, thanks again, David, for uh, telling us more about it. Oh, Matt, sincerely, thank you. I, I sought you out for this interview because I knew we'd have such a fun conversation, oh, and it really right. was. So the pleasure was all mine. Thank you very you much. You get a couple of writers like us together, we can geek out about this. Oh, man. <laughs> In ways that only geeks could have a dream of geeking. That's right. I can hear the music right now. There are hooks <laughs> creeping up on both of us because I'm sure we could keep going. But it was a lot of fun, so thanks for having me back on. Absolutely. See you next book. That's all for this episode. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, be sure to pick up a copy of David's book. I will have the links, of course, in the show notes. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, if you want a signed copy, you'll have to talk to uh, David about that. But he's very accessible, very approachable, very nice guy. Uh, so just uh, check around his website. Contact him. I'm sure he'll be able to help you out with this. But uh, I've read the book. It's fantastic stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm sure if you like this uh, show, you'll like his book. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, anyway, I've already, I just finished another episode, so I won't do another new segment here uh, or a quote, uh, but just I do want to say thank you again uh, for supporting the show and keeping these episodes, you know, keeping the Matt Chat phenomenon uh, alive. Couldn't do it, wouldn't do it without you. So thank you so much and see you next time. me to do I don't know Morris you're the genius around here all right let's have a look at it.